Hey guys, welcome back to the Dog Tribe Podcast. Today we're back with Justin in the podcast studio uh, and we're catching up and we're going to be talking about dog drama today. Dog drama. <laughs> um, obviously there's a lot of it. We've always kind of um, followed it over the years and accidentally been involved in it sometimes. Um, but I think that the reason I wanted to talk about it is actually kind of a good topic. There's a lot going on. In the dog industry, honestly, we see it on the ICP side, like, you know, things that pop up and things that people do that they just shouldn't do. Um, sometimes drama is, um, I would say, there's a little bit of truth to it, you know, which is why it starts. Um, but yeah, I feel like you and I have gotten to a good place, a good mental headspace about this kind of stuff, what we want to be involved in, what we don't want to be involved in. And I think that's been the maturing process because I used to get so freaking mad. We used to get real mad about this. Um, I remember driving to work sometimes and like, you know, being in my head about something and then I'd see you and then you're like, oh, you can tell Justin's in his head about something that, you know, uh, or I'm annoyed by it. Um, but yeah, so this is actually how I figured out there was another dog daddy. We were just talking about that right now. Um, so the guy's gotten a lot of press and a lot of attention. Um, but that's not how I, I, I found out about him. Actually, someone reached out to me and was like, hey, dude, um, you know, I need some help. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm like excited to help people, right? Like, what do you need? And he said, you know, I got myself into a bit of trouble. And I know um, you've been part of a lot of con controversy lately. Um, and... I was like, what? You know, I like started Googling myself. I was like <laughs> Googling like Fabian, you know, Fabian Romo. She kind of like, what is, what is it that I'm part of, right? Uh, I didn't, it didn't honestly even phase me at the time just because um, I feel like growing a business, you've definitely encountered the people that were very upset, right, uh, about certain things. Um, and uh, and so you get used to it and like, oh, maybe there's probably a practical solution or some sort of misinformation. Yeah. on things uh but anyway i looked it up and i was like this guy you know swing dogs around so for those of those those of you guys listening i'm a very different person i dress very differently to begin with you know like that's the that's the thing that gets me <laughs> on it and i called my name the dog daddy was because i don't have any children so i have dogs as children right yeah. uh so not that i will have any but i'm just saying at the moment i don't so i have a lot of dogs um but yeah man what's your take on 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 the serious note, there's a lot of um, misconception about balance training. And I think that that's what the, what the general understanding of, of this, what the general focus of this podcast yeah. is. Yeah, my interpretation of like the climate uh, right now, I, it's gotten better, you know, I would say in the perception of the clients that come to us. But overall, I can see there's a, a lot of major misconceptions about what balance training actually is. Is it, it seems to me that the idea is, is if you do anything other than conflict free, there's a stigma to it, right? What I like to convey when we're doing sessions and working with clients is we are balanced. So we 100% utilize tools, but there's a whole, uh, well, there's a whole process to the tools, but more than that, we also very frequently and quite possibly like mostly utilize positive reinforcement training balance. It just, it just helps to complete the picture in our, in our opinions. Right. <clears throat> and so, you know, when the idea of utilizing tools comes up, people instantly think of the most intense corrections that they could even imagine. And that's just not what balance training is and really, you know, more intense correction or sorry, punishments. Right. Cause I like to specify the difference between correction and punishment. Punishment is something definitely more adversive, something that's going to help the behavior go away, right? We don't want to see the lunging at people anymore. We, we don't want to see the excessive barking in the home or the jumping on the counter and actually then, uh, you know, eating something unhealthy or something that's bad for the dog, right? There's some times where we will utilize uh, positive punishment to actually make something right. decrease and go away, right? But a correction, we can utilize these same tools. A correction is just correcting a simple mistake that the dog makes, right? An example I give is if you're walking, the dog's looking good. Dog starts pulling towards the grass a little bit. We're not going to punish the dog very intensely. We're just going to guide them back into position and keep the walk going. And so I think once people understand that there's levels to things and it's not all just 
using the tool, using the tool, using the tool, people become a lot more comfortable. But there's definitely a lot of misconceptions about it. Right. And I would say that we're definitely at the forefront of trying to, you know, clarify that misconception. Um, but it definitely comes with a lot of uh, a lot of challenges for sure. Right. A lot of people come in the doors and have no true concept of what real balance training is. They've only just seen uh, online kind of the, the other dog daddies. Right where they're, they're doing right. like ridiculous things with dogs that just really doesn't make any type of sense at all. Um, you know, I personally and found does not subscribe to like an alpha dog mentality and, and getting really physical and really personal with dogs. Cause in a lot of cases it, it right. just doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, it causes a lot of stress unnecessarily. Um, it just puts a lot of strain on the relationship between you and the dog unnecessarily, especially if the ultimate goal, the outcome that we seek is a dog that's happy, healthy, attentive, focused, right? So yeah, balance training just isn't what people see. Anything that's like really glorified online for what not to do, that's not what balance training is. Yeah, and there's a lot to that. Um, my personal opinion about balance training, I absolutely agree with, with everything you've said. I would say that a lot of trainers that are currently training dogs don't really know what balance training is. Right. And I know because, you know, we see it when we interact with them, we see it uh, in other education aspect of things where we're, you know, kind of doing market research and you're like, oh, that's not balanced training. That's kind of like yes, no training. Right. And yes, no training is very different than balanced training, which is why ultimately, like, I feel maybe we need to move away from the term balanced training because it's just been so overused. Like when you think positive only, I'm like, okay, like it's for me, it's not just about like the positive only aspect of things, but it tells me, I feel like it tells me a lot about a person and whether or not I'm going to get along with them. Um, that being said is because there's a natural order of things when I think about training animals, right? And I, there's a natural order uh, when it comes to, um, you know, how society is structured, right? Not everything in our lives is actually uh, positive only, or it's all about positive experiences. There's a lot of things um, out there that where people are constantly trying to chase positive experiences and the, how that leads to depression, right? And how there's a level of challenge that builds confidence. There's a level of, of there's a level of uh, hardship that creates uh, um, satisfaction and happiness, right? So overcoming challenges. And honestly, when you see dogs overcome challenges, you see they're like, oh, I'm so happy about this, right? And like, wow, that was good. I got the right answer. And so for me, balance training sometimes it gives a, it, it has a, a negative connotation because we've argued about it for so long, right? Even within the balance community, um, they, they argue about what is and what doesn't apply. And they kind of try to grab literature available to try to paint the picture of whatever it is that they need, right? Whatever it is that they're arguing. And my approach in, Honestly, it's not even my approach. Like I would consider it more like a natural approach is that um, the dog, when the dog's hungry, the dog it wants to interact with you because you have food, right? There's a very simple concept of that. Uh, one of the, the, we, the things that we've learned about rescue in rescuing puppies and you've seen with the litters, et cetera, it's that the moms, uh, the moms of the puppies sometimes correct dogs, right? They get annoyed with them and it doesn't come from a place of like, of it's not malicious no it's but it is emotional you know yeah. it's not malicious but it is emotional it establishes boundaries right and you see that when like at some point the mom is tired of nursing the puppies and she's running around the room and she's like get these things away from me and she sets those boundaries like no more leave me alone right and there are moms that are not like that there's like you know uh mom dogs that uh that are not like that and so then they get beat up by the puppies and you have to intervene and you know separate her from the puppies. And so you see a lot of natural consequences. And I've always been of the mindset and, and kind of fallen into this where the smarter the animal, the more complex uh, their training can be and the more different types of accountability, right? It has to be a big part of their system. Um, just like for us, like we know that, that if we blow a red light ticket there or blow a red light, you're going to get a ticket or you might get hit by a car, right? Like you may be a cause of car accident. So there's a lot of natural occurrences where if you're not careful, you're not following the rules, et cetera, there are negative consequences in your life, right? 
if you don't pay the ticket, guess what? You get a fee on top of that ticket. I've, yeah. been, I've been that. And at some point you're like, yeah. all right, I can't do this again. This is at some point they'll boot your car. Right. But that's because we're intellectual creatures. We can deal yeah. with like the emotions of stuff. And there are some dogs, especially within dogs that are like, that do not, I don't want to say they're not smart, but they have different attributes to them and they will push the boundaries over and over again. Um, and so you, you can't really call it, I wouldn't call it balance because I think that, A, that's got a negative connotation, but I think it's more or less like, I don't know, there's got to be a different term for it, you know? Um, but there's a lot of controversy, controversy with that, um, especially right now. And I've definitely been around a lot of trainers that they put a prong in the dog and they just make it stop, right? And to some degree, um, sometimes I feel like it's a little weird. Like some of the training approaches are a little weird. Like, um, like I just don't consider you a person that would alpha roll a dog and think that that is the best way of handling that, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely not. It, for me, it's like you have to, within your system, you have to have some criteria that you're trying to right, right? If I'm working any dog, right, actually doesn't matter the type of dog, the type of issues, one of the main goals is we want them to be motivated to actually do things because when they're motivated to do things, well, regardless of uh, super defensive, super anxious, scared, just so happy and stimulated that he just doesn't listen all that well, like if I'm asking the dog to do something, I need motivation to be there so it's just more fluid, right? What we can't have is just day in, day out, just making the dog do things. Because again, that kills relationship and, and it kills reliability. So like at a, as a standard, building motivation and relationship is just layered into our training. So what has to be done is what is necessary to develop those very positive uh, aspects of our training system. Right. You know? And I think a, uh, an aspect of of things that we forget about as trainers is that it's really our job to communicate that to owners, right? Because it's ultimately them that when it comes to legislation, when it comes to tool bans or certifications, it's really the consumer that's going to dictate a lot of that, right? Because what they're happy with, they're not happy with. And so making sure that we're on top of our terminology, making sure we're on top of our processes is going to make a balanced approach to training more comprehensible to the average consumer, right? Because yeah. I feel like that's where a lot of the challenges come in. It's like you're working with a client and I've definitely had my fair share of clients where I've had situations where I, somebody comes in with two really reactive German Shepherds, right? And, you know, they've been to a lot of different trainers that typically the ML, right? They come in and they're like, yeah, I've been through other trainers and, you know, some people have put the e-collar on my dog and just fried my dog. And now my dog's that super sister's behaviors. It's, it's, it's anxious when it's got the collar. We're reactive. Yeah. Right. And, and they also, those people will consider themselves balanced training over oh, balanced training because we do X, Y, and Z. We use training tools. Like it, yeah. it's, it, and that's just kind of like when you group everybody in one situation, it creates a problem, including in the consumer side. That's how the water is getting muddy. Dude. Yeah, dude. Because then those guys are coming in and saying, those clients are coming in and saying, you have, you're also a balanced trainer, but the last guy was a balanced trainer. So maybe this just isn't for me, right? When it's a very different approach. And this client that I was talking about walked in with two German Shepherds and they've been through different types of training and the dogs are very reactive, knocking them over. And, you know, I remember saying, okay, hold on, I'm going to go get some stuff. So I wanted to get, grab two prong collars. And we saw the prong collars. He was incredibly upset. He was so pissed. He literally said, don't put that shit on my dogs. I, and I was like, okay, you know, I was like, okay, first of all, at this point in my career, I was already like, chill out, dude, we're going to talk about this before yeah, we move hey, forward, hey. right? Uh, you don't have to be so aggressive. And again, it's our job to get through that. There's a lot of people that would just say, hey, screw that person. They can go somewhere else. You're only going to work, you know, with me, within my system and all these different, that is so immature, so immature. Like if you really care about the dogs and you really care about the dog training and the proper use of tools. You can't have that mindset, you know? So I kind of took the brunt of that and I was like, okay. Um, well, just understand people. It's yeah. emotional responses. Dude, I, yeah, 100%. Again, the, the emotion is I'm concerned and fearful of a tool being used on my dog that's going to make them extremely uncomfortable and unhappy. And I'm afraid of that. Right? So it's like a trauma response, right? 
uh, people here have heard the horror stories. They've seen the horror stories. And so yeah, it's just an emotional response. Yeah. And so to your point, that's a very good point. It's, it's extremely immature as a professional to just, well, just go somewhere else. Yeah. Cause you're a coach. I don't want to do You know, people are coaches and you have 100%. to be emotionally aware of your coach. Yeah, no, at the end of the day, you have to educate people. Like it, it a lot of times I've dealt with people that have come in and been like, I don't want to do e-collar. The immediate next question is, okay, cool. Well, let's talk about it. Like, why are you against the e-collar? What information have you had? Right. As this is the tool that I think would be the best tool for your dog for reasons X, Y, and Z. But I'm, I would love to hear your feedback. Why are we concerned about e-collar? And a lot of times we can have a really good conversation. Of course, there's a number of individuals that are like, that's just not for me. But we part ways amicably and like it, it's just, they got information, right? Right. Sometimes those people come back Dude, six months to a back. year later yeah. and we end up working with the dog with the e-collar because they've tried more. Uh, I would say more positive based conflict free training and it just it just still doesn't work out for them in particular. And, you know, we kind of talk them through the process of tools and things go really well. You know, uh, I have evals that should be 30 minutes end up an hour and a half because it's just a good conversation kind of explaining to clients like how this tool can actually be utilized properly and kind of we speak to the things that they've seen and that they've heard and explain why we don't do those right. things. And I do want to add to what you just said, where you're like, hey, I spent an hour and a half working or explaining to someone the way we use training equipment as an evaluation. And that's huge, you know, because in reality, in our industry, it's the word of mouth that matters, right? So they know they came in, they spoke to Justin and they're like, wow, this guy just knows so much. We're comfortable. They're going to tell everybody, especially if training successful, like, we're, you know, overall, it can be a home run for your business. Um, it could be a home run for your team and, you know, and, and that's where all of that starts. But going back to the story, this gentleman was very upset. He was there with his wife, right? He said, don't put that shit on my dogs. And I, at that point, I, you know, I'm, I find some humor in just about everything that's that harsh, right? I'm like, okay, it doesn't have to be that serious. And I said, listen, let me put this on you and put this on your arm, right? And I want you to give me five minutes with your dog. Like, just give me five minutes and I want to introduce it in a way where, uh, we're going to be using food, but also in a way that we have activities that we structure in front of you and we apply this training equipment in a very strategic manner within the activity. So you see the benefits and we start getting into how the prong collar has just like an e-collar, low level, medium level, and high level applications of the e-collar, right? I mean, the prong collar. And when he understood that, he became one of my favorite people. You know, we went out and said, they, the next thing they, they wanted to do was to do the e-collar. So we went out to the house. We did some yard work uh, with the dog. So they were running by the fence. We introduced the e-collar. We called the dog off. We were able to call the dog off, put him on the play sport, released him back. And he invited me over to dinner. And this customer, this owner um, wanted us to be friends, you know, and, and just because we've done the great job. But usually those conflicts create the best relationships, you know? And of course you get your, your, your set of clients that are just looking to sometimes be unhappy. Right. And for me, it, it was very far and few in between. I would say once every year we get two or three out of several hundred clients that are just like, Hey, I'm unhappy about this. Or I don't like the approach to that. I had someone, um, several years ago. I had created a summary video. We went through the entire training approach with them in the consultation, came in, I took the Rottweiler. The Rottweiler was um, super reactive, really big, like 90 pound Rottweiler. And I remember sending that video out to them and they were very upset. You know, they were very upset. I'm like, no, we talked about this, whatever. And they basically said to me, I want my dog out of that place right now. Um, and I'm going to call the cops. This is dog abuse. This is the whole thing. And I was out of dinner and I literally stepped in and I said, okay, I'm going to go get your dog. Cool. I went over, got the dog. Literally the cops were here, right? The cops were here and um, they're like, hey, we had this uh, person uh, follow a report and they, you know, they claim dog abuse, right? And that's a very natural process. And so it was an emotional decision, the owner, because I was like, okay, I'm going to grab the dog and brought it out to them. And the entire process, the cops were almost bit uh, by that dog. It was a big Rottweiler. 
And I, at that point, I find it kind of comical, right? Because, you know, the dog was fine, great health, everything was fine. Dog went home. And you could tell she was very upset. But I handled the whole thing. I was like, dude, I don't, I don't want to train your dog if you don't want me to train your dog. I don't want to, like, argue with you about training methods if you don't want to listen. Like, I, I, you know, I think that this is what you need. And, you know, and they wrapped up the set. Uh, it was a quick 10-minute exchange. Got the dog. Here you go. Went her away. She's like, I want a refund. I'm like, here's your refund. Here you go. Full refund. Because the faster we can conserve that energy and move on to other things, the better. That's always been the mantra, right? And the funny part to me was that they couldn't even get a statement from her because the dog was losing it at the police officers during the entire time. Um, but there's like situations like that that are just harsh. But I think that having a coaching mindset is super important. Like this, this industry, especially behavioral cases and training tools, is not for the faint of heart. I mean, there is like, there's a lot of information to be had with that. You know, and I'm sure you face your, your set of clients that. Oh, really yeah, do. 100%. I mean. Like, like, to your point, like, you're not going to change everyone's mind, uh, even when you're coming at them with really good information. Sometimes just morally, it's just, it's just not to the, you know, for them. They don't really want to engage in utilizing the tools. I've had people go through full programs and then just stop using the tool. Right. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of times it's more of like, when I check in, it's like, mm, I've been hesitant to use it because I just... I didn't feel comfortable using it with you not here. So cool. Well, let's just proactively set up a session. Let's get you back on track and let's show you how to, how to use it because it just helps so many people. When, when I think of the utilization of tools, right? Again, it's, it's not something to uh, assert yourself over the dog per se. It, it literally is just a tool. And, you know, I am a major advocate of the tools when I'm working with uh, more elderly people, people with physical disabilities, choice sometimes. you know what I mean? Physically smaller individuals in comparison to their dog. I've worked uh, with 115 pound women that have these 90 pound, big headed, beefy pit bulls that they literally, despite the dog being maybe on the friendlier side, uh, simply they can't control it because right. he sees a dog and they want to pull him into the street and, you know. It's just, it's just a, an issue. You know, I've worked with clients that have been pulled into the side of buildings, uh, shoulder shattered, elbow shattered, right? Like crazy injuries because they, they simply can't uh, prevent the dog from pulling. doesn't matter if they're on a harness, prong collar, uh, choker chain, whatever they're using, like the dog is just strong enough to pull through it. And so, you know, there's just a massive space for these tools to be really, really useful. Uh, and you just hope that you can convince everyone of that and like really explain to them. But yeah, no, I've totally had some people like return the e-collar after a full program and like they see the results and everything's happy. But for them, they just can't bring themselves to utilize it and actually give a consequence when it's appropriate, you know, right. despite the training. And again, still, you're just cool with those people. No harm, no foul. It's right. just, you know, we can try to work it a different way you're just realistically will be most successful like this. Right. And I think there's a level of like, there's what I would consider sets of priorities, right? For me and for us, I would say for us, because of the horror stories we've seen, you know, and I was uh, talking about this to some of my neighbors at our block party this last weekend, because some of the horror stories we have seen, I place human safety first and then the dogs. Right. A hundred percent. That's always me. And I, and when you, that's why we're doing this, right? That's, I, the society we live in. that's the society that we live in. But honestly, like, that's the way I do it is I, I think that through our discussions, we discovered that the reason we do this is because we enjoy helping people. Right. And we enjoy helping animals. Sure. But animals are owned by people. Right. Like you, you have to, if you want an animal to be treated well, you have to convince the owner who owns that dog to treat them well. It's not about like, yeah, the best. And sometimes I joke around where it's like, this two, three weeks, buddy, that you spent with me are like the best three weeks of your life yeah. because it's like they may not have the time or they're not going to go to park and play fetch or do all these additional stuff. Yeah. But it honestly, it's, it's part of our jobs and part of our ongoing mission is like, well, if I'm going to grab a dog that's like high drive, I'm going to teach him fetch, tug, some off-leash work, some manners and things that, that they need in order to live a comfortable life with their owners. My job is also to take that owner and say, Let's go. And I want you see, I want you to see these things that your dog can do. Because if your dog can do them and you're impressed by them, you're gonna do them more often and you're gonna take your dog 
more places and do more things with them because the dog's easier to deal with, right? And and I think that's a combination of like, we love the dogs and we care about them and we also care about the people's success and their level of satisfaction. But sometimes in the training community, when you have individuals that are not willing to take that approach, what ends up happening is that you hurt the industry as a whole because you're advocating around about you're advocating against things that make practical sense. And most of the time you advocate for things against things that make practical sense because there's a level of emotion you may have, or people may have about a training tool, about an experience, about themselves. Often enough, I find that the way you treat animals sometimes has a level, has a connection to the way you grew up, right? And the way you grew up, the way you saw other people treat animals, the way you saw people treat each other. And sometimes if you see not so nice things, I mean, there's plenty of studies that I'm not a human psychologist, but there is a connection between animal abuse and some um, early abuse in childhood, right? And there's also connections between, and so I find that the opposite is also true, which is like the lack of like sometimes firmness. If you, have, if you own a Malinois or you own a high drive pit bull, there's a level of firmness that you need to have to the dog, not to establish dominance or to show them that you're the big boss and you're in charge. As some people would say, it's honestly so that the dog understands environmental consequences because that dog is probably like a top predator within the immediate area. Meaning that yeah. if that dog really wanted to maul someone and it's a big dog, he probably could, right? And so the dog needs to understand depending on personality and drives, uh, some sort of environmental consequences to understand where it stands in the environment, right? And people actually do that in the, in the back thoughts of their mind, right? They, they all know, it's like, okay, I can do this, I can do this, et cetera, et cetera. And those are things that govern our lives. Um, but individuals that advocate against balanced training or a training that I would say it's more complete, sometimes are hindering the overall dog training industry because they're not really being honest about the natural world. That's my stance. They're just not being honest about the natural world, how we operate it as humans within it, but also how animals interact with each other. You yeah. know, that's, that's kind of like what I've, um, you know, noted. And it's the same thing with the balanced dog training community, because if you're a dog trainer and you say, I alpha roll a dog. You clearly have not been mauled by dogs, right? right. Like I've seen, I remember in the early years, <laughs> this big American bulldog, like huge. He's an American bulldog or something like that. Um, and he was huge and he would bite people. He would go up to them and be like, hey, bite, right? Yeah. And someone came in and that was before I considered myself a trainer. I didn't consider myself a trainer for the first 10 years of my career. I'm like, I don't know how to train dogs, right? And I've been running them. But it's like anyone that will walk up to me and say, hey, I'm a dog trainer. I can help you. I'm like, okay, please help me with this dog yeah. or help me care for this dog. Or give me advice on it. And they do all sorts of weird things. Sometimes they do weird things that are like, I'm really like, oh, we must be hitting somewhere I've never seen, right? Like I'm so excited to see where it plays out. And so this gentleman um, came in, tried to take this bulldog, tried to alpha roll this bulldog and was poking him on the side and whatever. And that the dog bit him up so bad. And I remember... It was the funniest thing. I was just like, oh, okay. So this is, she took a bite. Like, you know, like that Cesar Milan video where there's a lab that like he checked yeah. and the dog it was, was like, Holly, yeah. you know, it was just like, yeah. ah, you know, yeah. for a couple of seconds, that's the type of bite that, that he had. Yeah. And I sat there and thinking like, oh shit, like that had to fucking hurt. That really hurt. It hurt me. And the guy was like, no, it's cool. Like I'm gonna keep going with this exercise. And they just like fake it, you know, they're fake it. And yeah. then they're like, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna to go home. It's going to take a couple more sessions to do this, right? It's wild, man. But those people, they hurt the community, you know? Yeah. And I don't know where that comes from. I, I, I think it comes from a place to like, I must dominate the thing in front of me and dogs yeah. are the item. I don't know. Uh, well, I tell you, I mean, oh, when it comes to like PSA, we've been around some, oh, dude. some tough dogs that you could not do that to right. you can't. safely by any means. Uh, a crazy story I tell quite frequently uh, to clients and like the staff is uh, about Gustavo. So Gustavo is a dog that we worked with, I don't know, maybe six months, almost a year ago now. Uh, he's like a big 
like English bulldog mix, right? Uh, very defensive with his owner, right? Very obedient. Like we'll do all the obedient stuff, right? Great. But was launching at people, like right. trying to like snatch them up. Like, and then the, the scarier part is completely silent. Right. Wouldn't bark, wouldn't growl. It's like that frog leap. He's just leash. staring at you. He goes from staring at you to launching at you right. within two seconds, right? So he's here for about a week. Me and him are like homies. Everything is going great, right? He's not trying to eat me anymore. Cool. In the session with the owner, she's sitting right next to me on the bench. I made the mistake of trying to hand her some food from my pouch across my body. Gustavo saw that, launched at me, and literally his body checked me in the chest. Now, instinctively, I push him off of me. It wasn't a bald fist. It wasn't a kick. Physically pushed him off of me. When I say that dog was so angry at the fact that I pushed him off of me, fully intended to bite my leg. Right. Right. And if, if she hears this, she'll probably laugh to herself, but her, his owner was fantastic. He had a leash on. I go, got to lean back, get him <laughs> off of me. Like you got to pull back because he's, because he was latched onto my pants leg. Oh. And if he counters, then he's actually going to get my skin. Right. 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 right? right. So I'm like, you got to lean back. And when I say he, she goes, my arms are getting tired. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, what do I do? Just rip the pants leg. Just pull as hard as you can. One last push. And she pulled. And of course, my pants leg came off. But needless to say, alpha rolling that dog would not have been a solution to correct that dog in that moment. Yeah. It was a really intense moment with a very intense dog that was not going to let me alpha him, if you will. It just was, it was going to be a fight no matter what. Right. And so just that little push in like, give me some space, give me a boundary, kicked him into a whole nother gear that, that became very intense. Right. right. And so, so yeah, like to this day, me and that dog have a great relationship. Right. That was like one really bad session. Definitely the next session I had on some bite pants, but it, you know, I had to build relationship with that dog to find success. The owner had to maintain a good relationship, use some boundaries with the tools to right. help to eliminate a lot of those scenarios. And they appear to be doing perfectly fine nowadays, right? And she understands how, how far to push that dog and, like, what situations to put him in. Um, but we did not make that dog any better right? by being physical, alpha rolling, being too personal, right, in a negative way. It just, it just doesn't work. Yeah. There's, and there's a lot of argument out there right now that would, uh, maybe not right now, but over the course of time, there just is that if you took that dog Gustavo and you had him as a puppy and you gave him the perfect um, life, that maybe he would not behave that way. But I don't think that's always true. You know, well, sometimes it's genetic. Yeah, yeah, dude. You can't, like, you can't necessarily, like, train out defensiveness per se. Right. Right. You can work on. That's the dog's response to aggression yeah. or concern or, or that threat. Correct. A hundred percent. And, you know, because not all dogs, vast majority of dogs are not aggressive, right? Yeah. These dogs that we work with that um, a lot of times get bites on people, they're not aggressive dogs. They're a lot of times very defensive. Uh, That's a huge fact. Yeah, huge it's a fact. massive fact because I hear the word aggression all the time. My dog's aggressive. aggressive. I'm like, That's normal. Every dog In is the job form, the eval sheets, it's like aggressive, aggressive. It's like, okay, well, then I see the dog and there's something I do all the time. <laughs> Just to, just to show the clients, right? When I have that dog in front of me, a lot of times they're at the end of the leash, barking, going crazy. I stand my ground. I just stand in front of them. They back up and they, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I'm right? still growling, still weary, but then they don't launch and go back out again until I turn my back and move away. Right. Right? When Justin looks more vulnerable, well, now I can be big, bad, and boisterous. But when Justin faces me and it's more personal, I'm more of the dog that's looking to flee and get away. Right. Would I bite if Justin touches me right now? Of course, absolutely. Right. But the dog is not just pursuing me on sight, right? right? There's a massive difference between actually aggressive and defensive and just being more forward with that defensiveness. No, 100%. Um, and honestly, just sitting here talking to you, aggression is a very natural very natural emotion for the dogs. Like there is every, I've, as my experience as a tech when I was younger, um, there was a dog that came in and it stayed at the hospital for, uh, I think a total of two weeks because we didn't know what was going on with it. So there's all these tests and it was a super friendly dog, super wag, 
dude, we could not handle that dog by the end. By the end of the two weeks, that dog was like, I'm going to maul everybody in this room. And it was a behavioral case, right? But that to me taught me a lot about like, dude, we just poked and prodded this dog for two weeks. And now it's aggressive. It's, uh, yeah, 100%. You yeah. do that to a person can be aggressive. People can be aggressive. Um, you know, and so aggression is a very natural state for the dog. Now, if it's um, unprovoked or it's in the wrong time, that's where it can be an issue. But people misjudge that all the time. Where, like, going back to your story of Gustavo, that dog was probably homeboys with, like, Justin for the last several weeks. And then mom came around and was like, oh, I'm, hey, my mom's back. Justin, don't touch my mom. Mm -hmm. Justin, don't touch my mom. You know, I don't know what you're doing, but we were homeboys, but you're not going to touch my mom, right? Or you're not going to. And that mindset right there of the dog is something that needs to be addressed by the owner, right? Because it's a relationship thing. You can't step in and handle. If, if I have a dog on a leash and that dog's aggressing towards me or towards another person, and then you grab that dog or, or somebody else grabs that dog and he's like, I'm going to correct them. Then you're kind of like tainting the experience, which is like, hey, it's my dog. Like it will, yeah, you'll go away, but the dog will still be reactive because it's me that needs yeah. to address it or control. And I think that in that mindset, that is where a lot of behavioral uh, training goes wrong, but also like some owners, they need the training tools. You need the training tools to be able to control the dog to be able to give the dog a better experience overall and get past that threshold, right? So it's not, it's an emotional journey for the dog, but it's also an emotional journey for the people that are handling these dogs. And sometimes when we consider this, you know, Oscar Mora, who I talked to a lot, was somebody that, that put me onto this, is like, it can't be balanced training because there's so many people that affiliate themselves to balanced training that, we may not even think the same. Like the fact that yeah. some, like the dog daddy, uh, which I hate to even fucking mention his name. But anyway, so this guy shows up to the park and he's like throws prongs on every dog and like helicopters them, right? And so then the dog's squealing and screaming and he puts this on social media and they're like, oh, that's balanced training. That is not balanced training. That is like somebody, if someone came up to me right now and was just kind of trying to handle me or whatever, I might fight them. I'm probably going to fight them and we're like really a high state of confusion. And what we're doing is that we're trying to, in those moments, what this individual is trying to do, because I've seen it over and over again over the last decade and a half, is suppress behavior enough of a time for it to be called progress to only for that behavior to come back again when that person's not there, right? And people call that, that is not training, that is um, I would say abusing dogs, really, because you're just suppressing them. And totally, it's it's suppressing, you know, what, what they how they feel and what they want to do. A lot of times, I will see the behavior mutate. That's kind of how I refer to it. It'll mutate, and the dog will become less vocal, less forward, but still just as explosive and just as right. dangerous. So I'll learn to not lunge on a leash per se, right? But a stranger still can't come and pet me, right? I had that learned helplessness. I don't want to move. I don't want to budge because I know a massively traumatizing correction is coming my way, but I'm better emotionally, right? right? I'm just inactive from concern for my own safety. That's just not dog training. Right. No, at all. no, it's not. And it gives everybody a bad, it gives everyone that is using training tools a bad vibe, a bad name. Because there are so many factions within balanced training, right? I find myself looking at it as a very natural process. I grew up in Mexico in a farm in a village. And so I was very happy in my life. I was around a lot of animals, but I was always like, that animal's dangerous. There's a pack of dogs here. Those animals are dangerous. Um, and there's just that natural fear that during those times, everyone within that community is like, oh, yeah, the dogs do this. Oh, yeah. The cows kick if you try to do this. If they don't know you and you try to milk them, they're going to kick you, right? If um, there's a lot of natural consequences that happen that kind of shape my ideas about animals and dogs. They live in my house. I've had my pet dogs that are just love them to death and they live out their entire lives. And then they, um, you know, now we're into working dogs. And so these working dogs, you can't treat them like that because they'll destroy your house. And so then you live a life of routine with them, exercise training, and you have them for a reason or a purpose, right? And there's a very different mindset from the little, like, um, 
pet dog that I would have and, and love and care for to then like the dogs that are like, if this dog is out without me, he'll bite someone, right? If this dog goes into the office and Lobo's hanging out there, he's going to growl and he's going to bite someone, right? But so your approach should be very different. And, and so balanced training, I feel like it's already been tainted in this entire industry because no one's going to look at it and say, Hey, I'm a balanced trainer. No, because the guy dog daddy is swinging dogs around by the prong collar at the park and he's a balanced trainer. That's not balanced training. And I don't want to be a positive trainer because the affiliation for me is, uh, it, or what I would kind of put them or classify them as, as a, a group of people that are maybe not realistic about life itself. I hate to put it that way, but like for me, it's just like, oh, well, you're not really in tune with dogs because if you've been around animals the way I've been around animals and been dogs, been around dogs the way I've been around dogs and you've been around dogs and, and seen the horror stories we've seen, seen, you may be inclined to say, yeah, well, I will use trained tools too because they need control and they need guidance and, and how you use them is more of an ethical question more than it is a technical approach or a uh, name or a brand name. You know what I'm saying? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, I, I definitely am very aligned with that. Uh, the thing with the more conflict-free is most people do try that. Right. Like almost everyone that's come in here and ended up doing a rehab program or an adventure dog where we utilize e-collar for uh, to do the more fun things in life, right? They all have tried conflict-free. They've all right. tried food outside. They've all tried to ask the dog nicely. They've all tried that. And, and I know if legitimately, if it worked just on its own, uh, with the vast majority of dogs, you and I would probably stick to just food. Like if just food communicated as clearly as we wanted it to be, uh, as one, uh, as clearly as we wanted it to across the board for all dogs, all breeds, all right. sizes, all energy levels, like we would just use just food. 100%. It's so much easier. You know what I mean, and that is, yeah. I mean, a lot of the times people think we're in 2023 and so everything's got to be much better right and i try to say studied in human psychology and i read a lot of books about like uh, the way humans are built like uh, sapiens is a book that i love and is very dear to me because it just talks about like kind of the evolution of society to be as now like society has changed but we have not right and uh although we have a different perception of society as it was maybe 100 years ago 200 years ago Dogs have also uh, kind of remained the same. We've bred them a lot. And if anything, we've just not been consistent enough with the breeding. And everyone's kind of bred dogs, right? Uh, from, you know, unfortunately puppy mills and then the local breeders. And most of the time people aren't really paying attention to what they're breeding. They think they are, but the breeders that I trust have been doing like breeding for 25 years, right? And they're like, hey, I know these lines and they do this. And their temperaments of those dogs are just incredibly consistent, right? Yeah. And so a lot of that, like, I value because there's an art to it. I know I've also done a lot of rescue work and seen the things with that sometimes, you know, uh, that dogs that breed themselves, right, uh, and how that looks. And I think that that kind of narrates the way you should treat dogs, right? Like if you, but it gets skewed and it makes it more complicated when dogs are bred willy-nilly and then also we have dogs that are coming from the rescue system, right? Um, because we need to save those lives and we're big advocates for that. But also you're doing like forensic dog training, like, okay, where does behavior start? How did it evolve? You're right. You're, you're tracking the entire thing, thing. And there's for all training, there's a huge positive aspect of it. We're always using positive reinforcement. We're doing all sorts of, um, praise and motivation but at some point in time you know when you have a rescue dog and you give a lot of praise and motivation as a lot of our clients will probably hear this and, and be like yeah that's what happened to me is that that dog eventually is like oh cool these guys are here to serve me i could do whatever i want they you know i do whatever it is i play when i want to i nag them they give me attention and when the, and so i want to do that to everybody and whenever they don't get that then you get something called an extinction burst right and an extinction burst is basically like i'm going to do more of that behavior because uh, I think if I try harder, I'm rewarded. And then what do people do? They reward those behaviors, right? And then they start churning and developing behaviors. Um, and it's not uncommon for us to get the story of like, hey, I was driving through the um, 
through a neighborhood and there was a dog outside chained up, skin and bones. And I took it home and it's about a year old and it was kind of beat up and I fed it, nursed it back to health. And now I was to uh, maul other animals and sometimes maul people. And I don't know what to do. And so, you know, like it, uh, feeding it more food and doing more sometimes I don't want to say doing positive things, um, positive, uh, training and positive reinforcement is a huge part of everything you do. But at some point you're like, okay, where do we create the balance and how do we take a very natural approach to your behavior to get you to a better place? No, hundred percent with, with any dog, there needs to be established boundaries. And again, I don't want that misconception to be to establish boundaries. There need to be harsh corrections. Right. Sometimes it's as easy as just standing there with the dog, allowing them to wait at a door wait for some pause and just some focus on the human. Right. And then deliver a bunch of food and then you can start proceeding through the door. The dog picks up on the pattern and no longer pulls through the door. Right. right. It doesn't take big corrections on an e-collar to create that. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I think of just cause I do a lot of the behavior work is how people care for their more anxious dogs and how they take a dog that, uh, could have been led right? They're already working at a disadvantage when it comes to like genetics or whatever, right? They're already really worried about the environment very naturally. Humans didn't have to do anything to kind of create right. some anxiety and stress within the dog. We'll take that dog, be really, really loving and nice, and then create these like monster dogs that want to like eat on people, right? Right. As opposed to let's approach this with some leadership. Let's set some boundaries of, no, nah, you can't kind of lunge toward that thing. No, nah, you can't pull. I'm not going to uh, totally smother you with love and affection when you're at your most anxious, right. right? They, you know, no conflict isn't always the solution, right? We can't solve right. every problem with conflict either. Right. Uh, but a lot of times when you, when you challenge certain ideas that the dogs have, whether they are, uh, just more defensive and more forward or super anxious. When you challenge their ideas and you challenge what they kind of more naturally want to do, you can help create more of a confident, more balanced dog right. uh, that is more reliable in a lot of these situations that you would otherwise struggle in. If you take a dog that has no issues, right, you're not struggling with much at all, and you still work to establish those boundaries, it's even better because you don't really probably get into the realm of high levels of consequences. Uh, to, that makes you feel uncomfortable, right? You can use a very reasonable level of pressure and be like, no, just don't do that. We've trained you really highly. You're really motivated for what we're doing. We've never had to introduce uh, a massive punishment to you because you're just going with the flow because we've worked you within a system. Right. And so I think that's just, for me, what I wish more people could understand. You can teach boundaries and things while utilizing these tools without creating a overwhelmingly stressed out dog. Right. They can actually look forward to the help. Right. right? I call it help. Yeah, for sure. Like you're, you're he helping in their decision-making and to your point about like thing, uh, things can't always be positive. Sometimes correction and stuff like that is just not the approach or some sort of positive punishment. Agave, the little male that I have is a perfect example of a dog that's going to need training tools, uh, to some degree. Right. And, and the reason I say that is because we're walking through pup start and there's a cat in pup start, right? So she's 12 weeks old and she prey locks on it. She's like, there's a cat is in, I want to kill it. Like she looks at it and it's like this, this dog right now, 12 weeks old, will fight to the death with that cat to try to kill the cat. And if I, um, let her, it's going to get really hurt. Um, and so I'm not even going to try to address it right now because if I try to address it, the puppy doesn't have enough life experience around me or around the world around it for it, me to try to suppress what seems to be a very natural behavior for that dog. Right. right? right. And so I'm not even going to pick that bad. I'm like, okay, puppy, I'm going to pick you up or drag you out of the room. And we're going to address this at a little later time when we have a better relationship. We've done some great foundation, but at the end of the day, there's no ball. There's no treats. There's nothing that is going to satisfy that primal drive for that cat. Right. And so we're going to see if this is something that I even address, but I know it will require some control, right? It's going to require some control. Um, and it's the same thing. If I live in the city of Chicago with, uh, millions of people around us in Horner park, where there's literally all whatever dogs, people, 
whatever training scenario you need is there, right? This dog's gonna need to go to that park. This dog's gonna see squirrels. It's gonna see all sorts of animals. Um, this dog needs to run and exercise to feel satiated with its life and to feel happy with its life and fulfilled. And so that we don't get other weird behaviors, right? So this dog will need a level of off leash control. Sure. I can say, well, if I manage the food and all the training and this and that and the toys and the right reinforcers at the right times, the dog could be called off of a squirrel or a toy. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, for the safety of people, you need to have something on that dog that you can control with. And that's the knee collar. We we're not going to take the chance of accidentally, I did all this training, but then the dog didn't listen and killed a squirrel or, you know, scared a bunch of kids or no, no, no. Like regardless of the hours of thousands of hours I will put into this dog's training at the end of the day, it will have a knee collar when it's out in public and when it's doing stuff where it needs, I need that security for peace of mind. Cause I can't live with a dog injuring another person or, you know, I can't do that to myself and I can't do that to the dog. So regardless of the mantra, there's a level of added security that I will have by using an e-collar. Extra peace of mind. For sure. sure. For sure. We just don't live in, in a world where we can have dogs that are totally left to their own devices. Right. Humans are liable. Yeah. And maybe in the farm, and maybe in the farm setting um, where, you know, dogs have more freedom. But if you talk to any farmers, they're like, yeah, my dog needs to not kill the chickens. My dog needs to not... Um, you know, hurt the cattle. My dog needs some off leash control with the cattle and so, or with the horses. And so sometimes they're extremely good trainers and they've bred their working dogs themselves and their community for a long time. And the dog just is plug and play because of the genetic code they've built in border the collies, right? Border collies. Um, and there's a lot of that goes to that. And then there's people out there that say, I have an e-call on these dogs and I control them this way. Uh, because if you don't do that and the dogs wander off, they're going to do what dogs do. And sometimes they kill other things because they have a lot of drive or they get themselves in trouble or they get hit by cars on the road. And so regardless, sometimes people think that if I live outside of the city and do this thing with my dog, it's going to live a much better life. But yeah, but there's a level of control. I mean, you know, everything in this world is give and take, right? And there's a level of structure that we need to have or you will learn. Like, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of situations people end up in situations where they unfortunately learn horrible lessons. Um, but that's my stance. That, and that's why I would consider myself, I don't want to consider myself a balanced trainer because I think there's so much to it. And I think that if the dog daddy's out swinging dogs around with a prong collar and people label him as balanced training, I, I do not want anything, you know, I don't want any affiliation with that. And I think that maybe um, there's probably the group of people that we know, and we know a lot of amazing trainers, a lot of just amazing trainers with e-collars, food, and they're just incredible at what they do. I don't consider them balanced trainers. I think they're incredible dog trainers, and I think they need a classification of their own for all the effort, energy, and time, and education they put into what they do. Uh, but I don't think that's balanced training. Um, you know, so um, guys, we've got the signal that from Molly that it's time to wrap it up. So thanks for listening. And I hope some information is useful. I mean, there's gonna be plenty of this coming up. We, we love talking yeah. about it. And obviously we're always adding to our database. So thanks for everyone for sticking around and listening to it. And uh, we'll catch you guys in the next episode.